Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship service for Sunday, January 31, 2021, the last Sunday of January and the last day of one of the longest and coldest months of the year. We're almost out of it. It is a cold one out there today, so if you're warm where you are, consider yourself blessed and let us remember how fortunate we are to be able to come to a warm place. Interestingly enough, here at the church, we do have the heat turned on, but it's not that high. It feels a little bit nippy in here this morning. It'll be much warmer when you can come back and see the sanctuary for yourself. I wanted to record here today because uh, we have a change. We have a new banner. We have a nice communion table. We'll be using that a little bit. Some plants over there. We got the pulpit off to the side. We haven't been using that a whole lot lately, so uh, we're not. that's not the center of attention. Many of you might remember that picture that was hanging over on the farther wall. Now it's here, and we look forward to having you be able to join us again soon and be able to see what our sanctuary looks like and some of the improvements. Several announcements this morning. One has already been hinted at. We will be having communion, as this is the fifth Sunday of the month, and we'll be doing that toward the end of the service this morning. So if you want to pause your recording or if you need to get up and get your communion elements, now's a good time to do that. Connie and I will be using the traditional bread and grape juice here, but you could use whatever you'd like. You could have pizza and soda pop. Who's going to know the difference? The importance is not necessarily in the elements that we use, but the fact that we're remembering the body and the blood of Christ, and that is always a good thing. Also to announce that at the council meeting this past Monday night, the decision was made to continue with online services only throughout the month of February. We don't anticipate any change there. But on, fr on Sunday, February 14, Valentine's Day, no less, that's going to be a special day. From noon to 1 p.m., we're going to be serving another drive through meal this time. I don't know exactly what all is included, but I know that soup and dessert are part of that. So let's look forward to that on February the 14th. The number 111 is a good number. It used to be our house number when we lived on Main Street, so our address was 111 Main Street. That's about as generic of an address as you can get. I was giving that address to someone over the phone once to try and find our house, and they said, that sounds like a fake address to me. Is that really your address? Well, yes, it was. There's also a fiddle tune called Train Number 111, and it's one of my favorites. And there is a Psalm Number 111, and it also is one of my favorites. It's part of our lectionary readings for today. And the first four verses will serve as our call to worship. Praise the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Blessings to you as you worship with us this morning.
Well, hi, I'm Associate Pastor Adam Hauser with our children's time for this morning. This morning, I'm going to start off with a little magic trick. Okay, so I've got a deck of cards here, and I've already taken out the four jacks. Okay, see the four jacks there? So we're going to, going to pretend for this trick that the deck of cards, this is the rest of the, the cards here, uh, we're going to pretend that that's a building. And then uh, these four jacks we're going to pretend are four robbers. So the four robbers are going to helicopter down into the building and they land on top of the building there. And the first one goes down to the very bottom. And the next one goes somewhere around in the middle of the building. And the third one goes not quite as far down. And then uh, the last one stays on top there, just in case there's any trouble, uh, which there is trouble. Uh, the police come, and so now uh, the four robbers have to get out of there. And so their helicopter is back waiting for them on the top of the building. And so they all run back up through the building, and the first one gets in the helicopter, and then the next one gets on, the third one gets on, and finally the last one uh, makes it on there, and all four of the robbers make it back out of the building. Uh, which for the purpose of the card trick is a good thing in real life, eh, not as good. But for the trick, um, they all made it out, right? So I want to talk a little bit uh, this morning about tricks, about magic, and um, a little bit of how that pertains to what God spoke about prophets and Jesus being the greatest prophet. So in Deuteronomy... Deuteronomy 18, God is talking to Moses, and Moses is talking to the people. And I'll pick up in verse 17. Then the Lord replied to me, replied to Moses, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my, mer <laughs> I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. So that sounds pretty harsh right there with the, the last words in that verse. Let's not worry about that because I don't want us to worry about uh, being a false prophet. I want us to look at what it means to listen to other people. So the prophet that God said that he would raise up uh, refers to Jesus, but it also refers to other people and other prophets. And so prophets were people that brought the word of God uh, to, to others. And of course, Jesus was the word of God, is the word of God, and he is sort of the fullest example of that. And a little bit later in the service, we'll hear from Connie talking about um, a chapter or some verses in Mark uh, where Jesus is beginning to show who he truly is and beginning to show that he does have the true words of God, unlike other people. Some people try and use magic, right? They try and uh, do things that make them look good or make them look fancy, uh, and try and uh, make up words uh, to make themselves look better. And they might say that they're bringing it as the word of God, uh, but if it's not the true word of God, if it's not given by God, uh, then it's not true. And then they aren't words that we should listen to. And so sometimes it's hard to know. There's a lot of voices right now, a lot of people telling us different things. It's hard to always know what really is from God and what isn't. And so uh, one of the things to think about is that for me with this little card trick that I did here, um, you know, I can say that it was magic, right? That I tapped the, the deck and the cards came back up to the top, but it really wasn't. It was just a trick. Uh, it was just a silly little trick. I won't give away how it's done. Uh, maybe you figured it out anyway, but um, it's just a simple little trick like that. So if people are trying to do things that really don't make sense, where there's some kind of trick to it, some kind of way that it's, um, you know, that it, that it can't be shown or, or reason to be true, then it is reason to, to think about it. And, and one of the ways that we can find if, thing, if something is true or not uh, is to look in the Bible. And the word of God that we have in the Bible is a really good guide for us to be able to see 
if people are bringing true words from God or not. Another thing that we can do is to talk to people that we trust. So to talk to our parents, to talk to our pastors, uh, talk to your Sunday school teachers, uh, and, uh, and to kind of weigh things out that way. Like I said, we hear a lot of things in the world, and a lot of people are trying to say that they have these true words to give, but it isn't always. Sometimes it's just, it's just tricks. And uh, another way that we can tell is whether what people are saying is making them uh, better, making them seem bigger, making them gain more power, uh, then that's probably not from God. If it's from God, then it will be giving God more power or bringing actually uh, more to those that have less power. So uh, some things for us to think about and as we hear the words of Jesus a little bit later in the service uh, that we can see how Jesus spoke uh, in a way that the people knew that he was telling the truth. And so the words of Jesus that we have in scripture are the words that we can follow and always return to those above the words of anybody else. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you gave Jesus as the true prophet, as your son, to bring your word and to be your word. May we always uh, look to you, look to the words of Jesus, and to um, examine things with other trusted people that we would be able to identify your voice amongst all the other voices. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable Uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow who imagined the sun and give source to its light yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night none can fathom indescribable the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, so struck we fall to our knees and we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. You are For our pastoral prayer time this morning, I have two specific requests. One is for our health care workers. And maybe you're tired of hearing about our health care workers. We bring them up almost every week, and it's a weekly announcement in our bulletin. However, 
For me personally, I've been able to see firsthand this past week just what they're up against and how daunting of a task it is for the nurses who are doing the testing out at the Maple Ridge Center in the cold weather and the winter time has made conditions pretty difficult and yet they soldier on and continue with the tremendous attitude. So we are going to pray for strength for them this morning. The second request I have is for those older persons who are bound in their homes and can't get out. And again, we have mentioned those persons many times before. But this past week, I had a conversation with one of those ladies. And I don't know who she is. I had never met her before. But I was asked to give her a call because she's struggling with depression and loneliness. And I am thankful for our prayer shawl ministry here at the Lowellville Mennonite Church because when I offered to send her a prayer shawl, she jumped at that and said that would be like getting a hug in the mail. So blessings to you ladies who are continuing with this very important ministry. So I'm going to read this prayer this morning, and perhaps you can pray this with me, but if you do, make sure you notice that we are volunteering our help to those who are in need. I'm guessing that you'll be able to pray this with me. God, we're worried about people, forgotten older people, children without mothers or fathers, prisoners of war, workers without jobs, people who have no homes, who are hungry or cold, people who live with problems that wind up tight inside. Show us, Lord, how we can help them. Give us the right words to tell them of your love. For Jesus' sake, amen. We don't have unclean spirits anymore. What? This Bible passage, it's about Jesus pulling an unclean spirit out of a man. How many people do you know who have had unclean spirits removed? It's not covered by any health plan I know of. Let's stop talking about what happened 2,000 years ago. Let's talk about what's happening now. Okay, what is happening now? People are struggling with the pressures to succeed, to make more money, pressure to be the perfect mom or dad or boss or whatever, buy more and more stuff, wear the right clothes, drive the right car, pressure to say the right things. And what do all those pressures do to people? Well, those pressures drive us nuts, that's what. Just like unclean spirits. What? Unclean spirits. It's the pressures of life that drive you off the deep end. Read the scripture passage. Jesus and his friends went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. The people in the synagogue were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, 
What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. The people in the synagogue were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Good morning. Today I would like to look at two of the lectionary passages. Our Old Testament passage for this week is from Deuteronomy 18 some of Moses' final words to the people of Israel. He was getting old and they wanted to know who would take his place. So Moses said, Then the Lord replied to me, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. Now Moses didn't mean just one prophet. There were many prophets that came after him who spoke to God's people on God's behalf. But the concept of a prophet like Moses is what led the people to think, to look for a Messiah, someone who would again lead the people in the ways of God. They were waiting for this prophet, this Messiah. And now the lectionary links this Deuteronomy passage to the scripture passage from the first chapter of Mark. Jesus is a prophet like Moses, but one greater than Moses. Now, in the beginning, Jesus was baptized and immediately tempted. Then he called the disciples. Now, by now, these men had probably started to wonder what in the world they were thinking when they dropped their nets and left everything behind. Maybe they were just wondering who this guy was, what exactly the plan was, where were they going to sleep that night, what was going to be for lunch. But this was the Sabbath, so Jesus took them to church, and he started to teach. I imagine there was an air of anticipation, wondering if he was finally going to tell them what would happen next. But whatever Jesus had chosen to speak about, Everyone listening was astounded and amazed by it. Then, in the middle of Jesus' teaching, along came a man with an unclean spirit. I wonder if there's any significance to the fact that this happened in the synagogue. Our first thought is that he must have been a visitor, someone just off the street, because certainly unclean spirits would not be present in church. But... Maybe he was a regular. And we can come up with all sorts of scientific explanations for what might have really been wrong with this man. So many theories have been put forth. Epilepsy, any number of mental illnesses or psychological disorders, and on and on and on. We aren't even given any symptoms, just a man with an unclean spirit. However, we don't need to put a label on this man to learn from the story. Now these days, we don't talk much about unclean spirits. Modern medicine has made great strides in the treatment and acceptance of those with mental illnesses and many other conditions, but there are still many things that keep us from experiencing all that God has for us. We could say that an unclean spirit is anything that has power over us that is not of God. All of us have behaviors we struggle with. Addictions, compulsive behaviors, obsessive thought patterns, destructive emotions such as greed, envy, anger, fear. Maybe driving out an unclean spirit can just be having the courage to confront those things in our lives that are not of God. But notice that whatever this man's condition was, it did not keep him from God's loving touch. Everyone, clean or unclean, healthy or ill, faithful or wayward, is in need of God's healing touch. I recently heard a person say, Joe Biden is pure evil. And I've also heard people say the same thing about Donald Trump. These are Christian people. 
but that is a conversation for another day. Now, politics aside, does God consider anyone pure evil? There are a host of things that could have been going on with this man and the unclean spirit. Yet there was something in him that Jesus saw as worthwhile, something worth fighting for. No matter how lost or evil a person may appear, every person has something good in them, something that God sees as lovable. Can we look for that in every person? Now, we don't want to get so caught up in the unclean spirit part that we miss the rest of what the man said. Because next, the man cries out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It is not Jesus who was seeking this confrontation. The unclean spirit did not want to lose control of the man. The unclean spirit recognized Jesus as the Son of God and was aware of the immediate threat from Jesus. What have you to do with us? Does us mean the many unclean spirits inside of the man? Or is the us the church? Jesus tells the unclean spirit to be silent. Why? It seems like he would want others to know about him. That is why he called the disciples, right? To spread the good news. There may be several reasons. Maybe he didn't want to be known for flashy, showy acts that took away from his message. Maybe the timing wasn't right. He had just called the disciples. Maybe he wanted to keep a low profile until they had figured out a few more things. Maybe he did not want so much attention focused on himself, but more on God. You know, the stories of Jesus' healing are not parables, but rather real incidents that, re that reveal who Jesus is what the gospel is all about. During Advent, we looked at Mary's song where she said, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This was referring to the reversal of fortunes that would be brought about by the coming of Jesus, how the world would be turned upside down. And here we see that the first person to recognize Jesus as the Holy One of God is the man with the unclean spirit. Jesus heals the one on the margins, an unclean person who would have been excluded. Now here is an example of that reversal of fortunes. By God's grace, the outcast is included. Those who heard Jesus teach compared him to the scribes. There is a difference between the authority of the scribes and the authority of Jesus. The scribes and church leaders debated the finer points of the law and exercised their authority by making hundreds of rules and regulations. These rules were clearly outlined and there was a high price to be paid if they were not followed. The leaders were authoritarian using fear or force to control the people. Now Jesus' style of leadership was more authoritative. He didn't punish people or pronounce God's judgment on those who sinned, he forgave them. During his three years of ministry though, Jesus took strong stands on issues, many of which were unpopular. He had high expectations of his disciples, even going so far as expecting them to leave everything behind and follow him. So while Jesus clearly rejected an authoritarian model, he did not reject the notion of authority. His authority came from God, and Jesus used this authority to reveal the kingdom of God to those around him. But you know, as time went on, the church became more authoritarian to the point where there was little distinction between political authority and spiritual authority. There have been times when the church has not exercised authority well. It has condemned, persecuted, and killed those who challenged its power. Throughout history, we see all too many examples of the abuse of authority by church leaders from the Crusades to recent sexual abuse scandals, to name just a few. And as a result, the trust that was once placed in both religious and political leaders has been betrayed. People have become suspicious and are now hesitant to recognize almost any authority. Right now, mistrust of authority abounds, religious, political, scientific. For example, 
In April of 1957, residents in the town of Protection, Kansas, set a public health example by becoming the first town in the nation to be fully inoculated against polio. One man, who was eight years old at the time, his last name happens to be Hurd, which seemed a little bit funny to me, but anyway, Mr. Hurd said, there was no doubt about the vaccine or the town's role in promoting it. Everyone thought, this is what we're supposed to do. It is good. Now fast forward 64 years later, and that town of 400 people is deeply divided, with many believing in a fake virus, conspiracy theories, and microchip-laced vaccines. Again, politics aside, but all of this dissension and polarization can be overwhelming. Who should we trust? Obviously, we must be discerning and look at the issues in light of Jesus' teachings. But in the end, what a relief to know that we can put our trust in Jesus, the highest authority. You know, Jesus' first act of ministry was breaking through a barrier put up by an unclean spirit, saying God is here in a situation where it seemed nothing was further from the truth. There are times in all of our lives when that does not seem to ring true. God feels distant, nowhere. There is doubt, disbelief, disappointment, despair. I have often felt those things, and I probably will again sometime in my life. But I need to remind myself of the times when I have felt God with me. Even a tiny little sliver of God can be enough to give me hope that God is indeed here. There may be times that I cry out, what do you want from me? But Jesus answers, be still. I am here now. I will take care of this for you. God is still at work casting out the unclean spirits of the world, and God will use us to continue to work by proclaiming wholeness to the broken, to the broken world around us. So let's ask, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Blessings to you in the coming week. Put peace into each other's hand And like a treasure hold it Protect it like a can flame with tenderness enfolded. Put peace into each other's hand with loving expectation. Be gentle in your words and ways, in touch with God's creation. Put peace into each other's hands Like bread we break for sharing Look people warmly in the eye Our life is meant for caring As at communion shape your hands Into a waiting craze gift of Christ receive, revere, united round the table. Put Christ into each other's hands. He is love's deepest measure. In love make peace, give peace a chance, and share it like a treasure. Two verses that start our communion time today from Psalm 111, the last two in the chapter, that shows the New Testament theme of redemption and gives us evidence that redemption was on God's heart all along, even in the Old Testament, and realized fully in Christ Jesus. 
He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy is his name. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who practice it. His praise endures forever. Blessed are you, O God. You made bread to strengthen us. You set aside this bread as a sign of your son's broken body. In breaking it, may we participate in the reconciliation of Christ. May Christ's body be the bread of our souls to give us strength to continue our pilgrimage, being made worthy to sit with all the redeemed at the marriage of the Feast of the Lamb. Remembering the body of Christ, let's eat together. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O God. You made the vine to strengthen us. You set aside this cup as a sign of your son's shed blood. In drinking the cup, may we participate in the blood of Christ. May Christ's blood make us strong to drink the cup of suffering without complaint for Jesus' sake, in the hope that we shall drink new wine in your kingdom. Remembering the blood of Christ and what it means for us. Let's drink together. Hear us, O God, for the sake of your eternal love. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope our communion time was meaningful to you. And a special commendation for the preacher this morning who chose that difficult passage to preach on. That's one that I probably would have skipped and chosen Psalm 111, for instance. For our benediction this morning, a few verses from the beginning of Ephesians chapter 4. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience and bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Blessings to you this coming week. Stay warm, everyone. <laughs>